so I'm, I'm really excited to get to uh, present today. Um, this is a, a topic that I'm really passionate about. I, I love uh, DBT and trauma in general and any opportunity I can get to uh, blend those two interests and really focus on how we build commitment, how we make this uh, more effective for our clients um, is, is a, a great opportunity. So um, a little bit about me, if the slides will change. Um, Okay, um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist at the Utah Center for Evidence-Based Treatment. Um, I did my uh, a couple of practicum years at, uh, at UCBT and uh, received training in dialectical behavior therapy through the Linehan Training Institute while I was here. Um, and I've had research and clinical interest in trauma-focused interventions uh, really throughout my entire training experience and now into my prof professional practice career. Um, I grew up in Nebraska. Um, I was an Omaha, Nebraska native, went to school in Lincoln. Um, and now since moving to Utah, I've become uh, an avid snowboarder and uh, I really enjoy living here. Uh, throughout my um, uh, throughout my training, it looks like everything. Okay, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat. Um, throughout my, like I said, throughout my training experience, I've really kind of looked for different ways as I've grown in my interest and really developed more of an interest in trauma-focused interventions and more interest in suicidality and suicidal behavior. Um, so DBT and uh, trauma interventions are, are two areas that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, more time reading about, um, and some time writing about. And I'm really excited to, to kind of take you through some things that I've learned, um, some areas that I, I think we can really expand as clinicians and healthcare professionals here um, in terms of making uh, trauma-focused inter interventions feel a little bit more less painful from the outset and using some, some things that I've learned uh, from my own study in DBT um, that have uh, been effective in, uh, in really transforming commitment uh, for trauma-focused interventions. Uh, so today, uh, the, 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 we're going to go through quite a bit here in the next, you know, 45 minutes or so, and I'll try to leave hopefully about 10 minutes at the end uh, for any questions. Um, obviously, if things do come up in the middle, feel free to raise your hand, uh, put it in the chat. I, I'm not going to be checking the chat super frequently, um, and so if you have a question and you're worried about forgetting it, feel free to put it in there and we'll try to get to it at the end. Um, but today we're going to start off with understanding what pretreatment is in the context of DBT. So um, we're going to go through the, you know, briefly go through the stages of DBT treatment and then really talk about this pretreatment phase that's kind of a mystery. Um, there's been very little, uh, like, really written on it. There's some trainings available. Um, and in the last couple of years, I've really dived into it because we found uh, that when pretreatment's done well um, in the context of DBT, it really increases overall effectiveness and can, can transform the therapy relationship. So we're gonna start with that, uh, with that in mind. Uh, I'm gonna take you through the principles of pretreatment, the active ingredients, so to speak, um, and give you an example of how I structure pretreatment here at UCBT, um, it, specifically for DBT. And then we'll talk about the elements of pretreatment uh, from DBT that are generalizable to trauma treatments. Uh, we're, we're really going to, I think these are actually, um, you know, something that could be useful for any, you know, evidence-based treatments that are out there. But particularly today, we're going to talk about trauma-focused uh, trauma -focused treatments and elements of DBT pretreatment that, uh, uh, that really work there. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time knowing and understanding who is going to benefit from a pretreatment phase in trauma-focused interventions. Uh, a little bit different than DBT, not everyone needs uh, an extended pretreatment for trauma-focused interventions. So we're going to try to talk about what um, you know, what might be, uh, what might tip you off that uh, you need to spend some more time in pretreatment with a particular client relative to another. Uh, so that's what we're going to get to today. So. Uh, Stages of treatment in DBT can get pretty dry. If you've ever read the, uh, you know, Marshall Linehan's Red Book, you probably were asleep by the time you got to the, uh, by the time you got to the stages of treatment. So um, I like this little graphic. Um, this is what I, this is usually what I use with my clients to kind of uh, orient them to, hey, this is what uh, DBT looks like in the course of treatment. So typically, um, we divide DBT into uh, really four stages. Um, and we usually meet our clients when they're in the, in the, in the basement of a burning house. Um, everything is really painful. There are a lot of problem behaviors that are occurring um, and they're screaming for help. Um, 
There is severe emotional pain, um, very few skills that are used to tolerate this, the, to tolerate the pain or manage that pain. And then they're usually being punished from their environment uh, because of their inability to control the pain. Um, that's what we call typical stage one behavior of DBT. Um, so this is the, the, the phase of DBT that folks are most familiar with, where there's individual therapy um, being used to help, to help folks get out of this burning house. There's group skills where you're learning uh, skills in emotion regulation, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness and mindfulness. Um, and then you're also using phone coaching. Now, uh, DBT, I, I think um, at times has gotten uh, a bit, maybe a bit of a simplified reputation as being a suicide prevention training. Uh, DBT is so much more than that. Uh, DBT is, is really at its heart a, uh, a, a treatment that seeks to build a life worth living for our clients. Um, so stage one is, is this first elemental, play, uh, elemental phase where we're trying to build the skills that are necessary uh, to A, uh, feel less overwhelmed and help life feel less painful, um, and B, uh, set the foundation for pursuing your life worth living. Now, pre-treatment shows up, um, uh, it also shows up in this phase as well. So before you even get into stage one, we have, uh, you know, a phase in DDT that we call pre-treatment that we're going to focus on today. Um, and this is a little bit like, um, you know, you're, you're a therapist, you enter this burning room where people have been, you know, screaming, help get me out of here. Um, and you offer a metal ladder. Um, now, metal ladders in burning rooms tend to heat up pretty quickly. Uh, and I try to orient my patients to, um, you know, to the function of pretreatment being uh, essentially me warning you that the ladder is very, very hot and it's the best way out of here. Um, the reason that we do this is because if you, you know, if you, uh, to go back to the metaphor, try to climb this burning ladder without any warning, you'll probably get halfway up, your fingers will start, your fingers will start to blister and bleed, and then you would hop down, turn around and look at me and be like, why did you tell me to do that? That was painful. I didn't like that. Um, now nothing works for me and I'm back in this burning room again. So pre-treatment is a way to, uh, to help orient you to what's coming, to anticipate barriers and to start to build uh, this therapeutic relationship that we're going to lean on. Um, in stage two of DBT treatment, um, this is where we typically uh, primarily address trauma. Um, I'll try to talk about the differences in trauma treatment from a DBT context versus, you know, trauma treatment as a standalone intervention um, at the end, but I just kind of wanted to give you a sense of, you know, from uh, a DBT perspective, you know, trauma treatment is typically done in this stage two, where you've already gone through skills and developed some skill in emotion regulation, distress tolerance, and now you're really targeting trauma specifically through exposures um, and addressing other lingering symptoms. Uh, another stage of treatment in DBT is uh, focused on identifying problems in daily living. So this is more mild affective symptoms. You're having very few, if any, problem behaviors and uh, the target is, is really trying to empower your clients to become uh, a problem solver, become uh, someone who isn't leaning on a therapist or other people to solve problems in daily living, daily living and is rather trusting their, their own way out. Um, and then in stage four, uh, we are identifying values and self-actualizing, trying to get committed action towards values. So this is the, you know, kind of the overall model of DBT. And today we're going to focus down here in this bottom right-hand corner on the pretreatment phase. Um, so I've already said pretreatment uh, several times today, um, but I want <laughs> let's spend a little bit of time uh, talking about why this is important. Uh, first and foremost, behavior change is hard and evidence-based treatments are extremely challenging. Uh, we demand a lot of our clients when we go through uh, evidence-based practice, we're asking them to become uh, really mindfully aware of the most painful elements of their life. Um, trusting a, tr a stranger who has uh, very little like relationship currency built up with them um, and asking them to uh, let us, you know, uh, bring, bring their awareness to mistakes that they've made, bring their awareness to the impact of pain on other people. Um, and then on top of that, do things differently. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's an element of consistent learning and applying new skills here where as we're learning uh, what hasn't worked before, we're trying to suggest new, new skills and changes. Um, and if you're a human being, you're likely familiar with uh, someone in your life has given you unwanted advice before. 
Um, and sometimes I feel like early on in, in, in treatments, there's um, this feeling of like, man, who do you like, what do you know about me? You don't know my life. Why, why would I listen to you? Um, so we're, we're asking a lot of our clients um, in evidence-based treatments and pre-treatment can be such an important phase for building up trust, uh, for understanding what buttons to push, what buttons not to push, um, and really understanding what hasn't worked before to set you up for success. Um, the other part that makes pre-treatment really important, is, especially before we dive into, um, you know, a change focused protocol, um, is that our clients are struggling now. Um, so it can be hard to say, hey, we're going to spend a couple of weeks uh, trying to get to know each other um, when they uh, are coming to us and saying, hey, my pain is, is right here in my face every day. I need change this moment. Um, typically at the outset of treatment, at the outset of treatment, it's our lowest point of skills and the greatest point and the greatest pain. And so we're trying to be aware of that and balance that, bring that into the conversation. Um, another reason that pre-treatment is important is um, if you haven't, uh, if you've gone through treatment before, had treatment failure, um, it's easy to internalize that. Um, you may have gone through, uh, you know, a, a PTSD protocol, dropped out halfway through and not really learned uh, why that, like, why that didn't work for you. Um, it's easy to have a therapy rupture either with your therapist or to just say, you know what, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Um, and that, that never gets fully processed. And so we want to, um, in pre-treatment really understand what hasn't worked before, um, and really build and validate like, Hey, it makes sense why this didn't happen. It, it, it wasn't you. It was, uh, you know, these behaviors, this action urge, this form of avoidance that showed up and got in the way of treatment. Um, there's not something inherently wrong with you. So we're trying to normalize the struggle with, uh, with past treatment failures and also uh, recognize what we can do different um, in this phase. And that's, that's another important aspect of, um, or kind of like outcome of pre-treatment. Um, from the therapist side, uh, when you encounter low motivation from a client um, or avoidance, particularly like, I know one of my hot buttons is like, man, when someone is just consistently not doing homework in between sessions and you're thinking to yourself like, man, this is just not going to work if the only time you're thinking about therapy is the 45 minutes a week that we're doing therapy. So having pre-treatment to assess low motivation, to anticipate avoidance and to get on the same page together about why this is important, about how you're going to handle, you know, non-adherence um, is really, it is really important for protecting your own burnout. Um, this is a, a way of ensuring you know what you're getting yourself into, you know uh, what kind of interpersonal style this client has, and you know um, what their uh, therapy interfering behaviors may or may not be. So you can kind of anticipate that and have a little bit more empathy or build up some resilience for, for, those, uh, for those folks. Um, I think it, at times when we, um, when we don't anticipate that, you kind of continue to encounter that, uh, that low motivation or that avoidance. And it's easy to start just saying like, man, this person just doesn't want to be here. They're wasting my time and their time. Um, and you kind of subtly begin to give off those like, you know what, maybe therapy isn't working. Maybe you should fire me, um, type vibes. So, so pre-treatment is super, super important for protecting your own burnout, for anticipate, for anticipating avoidance and for recognizing like, Hey, this is what, this is what it's going to look like when avoidance shows up. Uh, in treatment or when, uh, you know, when an interpersonal dynamic becomes a problem. So uh, we're going to kind of dive into what pre-treatment looks like in DBT specifically. Um, uh, I really want to emphasize that pre-treatment, especially in DBT, is a conversation. This is uh, going back and forth between you and the client to really understand each other, what each of you bring into the room, uh, and really kind of clarify your goalposts, uh, your goalposts and where you're heading towards. Um, I've described pre-treatment as, uh, you know, kind of packing for like a long canoe trip. Um, you want to, uh, before you like push off into the water, you want to make sure that you know where you want to go. Uh, you, uh, you know, want to make sure that you have enough food for, uh, you know, when the storms hit or if you get delayed, uh, you want to check all your equipment, make sure it's working. Um, and that conversation should be back and forth. You don't want to be the only one doing that work because um, ultimately it's not you who matters in this, uh, in this relationship. So the first goal uh, in pre-treatment is, uh, the first goal in pre-treatment here that we're going to go through is to clarify 
um, and really specifically behaviorally define your client's goals. Um, so uh, I try to go for a little bit more than uh, I am depressed and I don't like the way I feel right now. I want to hear, okay, what does depression look like in your daily life? Okay, you're missing class. You're not spending time with your friends. Why is that important? What do you want to do more of? Um, and so you can see how this, uh, this already can become a session long conversation about what you're, you know, when you really try to behaviorally define goals, this can uh, pretty easily fill an entire session. So uh, we don't need to rush this. You want to spend time, really make sure that the patient feels heard and that they, and that you understand their goals and maybe, and, you know, obviously more importantly, that they understand their goals for treatment. Uh, the second piece of DBT pretreatment is to orient to DBT's components, expectations, and assumptions. And you can, I, I think when pretreatment is a really effective conversation, this ties in really nicely to the first goal. So as you're defining uh, clients' goals, what they, what they want out of treatment, you can subtly reinforce the idea of like, oh, it seems like this friendship is really important for you, or maintaining and developing friendships are really important for you. We have an entire skills module that's dedicated to getting better at relationships, uh, how to communicate more effectively. So, you know, throughout this, um, you know, throughout this conversation, you want to give information about DBT and link it to what they want out of treatment. Um, there's, I, I, I'll occasionally kind of say like, all right, I'm switching into boring Jordan mode where I, uh, I, you know, kind of almost lecture about a dbt concept and then we turn it into a conversation hey how does that fit for you can you see how that connects to your goal to uh be more present with your children or with your kids um and again like you're you're trying to um you know really orient them to what they're getting into uh the third goal in dbt pretreatment is to uh, assess the severity the context and the function of problem behaviors um once we move to trauma, I think that the, the assessment, you know, this, this assessment may or may not be as, uh, as in-depth, uh, kind of, again, depending on the level of problem behavior. But the goal is, uh, the, goal is the same. You don't want to begin, uh, you know, begin DBT with someone and realize like, oh, there's uh, an eating disorder component here, uh, you know, daily self-harm and, uh, you know, and a functional uh, like a, a skills deficit in communication that's going to mean phone coaching is an ongoing thing. Uh, you don't want to get into all get into that and realize that like right as you head into Christmas and now you're, you know, your holiday time is ruined because you're spending time trying to work up, you know, work through and build up skills in a client and, uh, you know, and have this really burnout inducing function. So, so part of pretreatment is knowing uh, like, hey, what are the, what are the problem behaviors that are present? Do they, does the client see this as a problem? Uh, do they recognize how frequently this is happening? Uh, can you understand the context of this? And can you start to together understand what the function of problem behaviors are? Uh, why are you self-harming? What is, you know, is it that feeling of relief? What's, what's going on here? Um, and then um, again, in pretreatment, you're trying to extend commitment. So this is the, the part that really draws from motivational interviewing and other motivational enhancement treatments is uh, not only are you uh, you know, assessing and giving information, but you're trying to build motivation to do something that's really, really hard. Um, we're going to talk today about the interpersonal styles and strategies that DBT uses that that really, um, you know, functionally increase commitment pretty well. Um, but I want you to be thinking about, um, you know, really from the moment you begin pretreatment, how are you building commitment, um, you know, slowly or quickly uh, in the service of trying to reduce problem behaviors. And finally, um, the final goal of pretreatment and DBT is to, to build a strong relationship. Um, so despite all the structure and support in DBT, the phone coaching, group skills, um, the most active ingredient in symptom reduction and ultimately achieving therapeutic goals is the therapeutic relationship. You're trying to build a relationship by the end of pretreatment that you can lean on so that the, the patient understands what... Um, uh, that you have their best interests at heart, that this is something that th this is a place that they can be open, that they can be open and non and receive non-judgmental validation um, and intentionally, um, uh, intentionally uh, build towards a clear communication style with clear expectations. 
Um, sometimes this is easier, uh, easier said than done. That's, that's one of the reasons why pretreatment isn't necessarily like a set period of time in DBT. Um, building a strong relationship can take two sessions. It can take eight. Um, ultimately, you're, you're trying to, you know, kind of figure out what therapeutic scars may or may not be present and position yourself um, as an aligned figure who, who can then, um, you know, challenge someone and, and push, for, push for change without um, overdoing it. Um, to return to our, our ladder metaphor, you want to be someone who they, they can trust that when the, the ladder starts burning as they're climbing out of that first room, they know that this is, uh, that your encouragement to keep climbing the ladder isn't just for them to feel pain, it's actually to get them where they want to go and pain is an expected um, you know, behavior change pain is an expected element, uh, expected element here. So I hope that's, I hope that comes across here. Um, okay, so I'm just going to give uh, kind of a quick overview of um, the, the general pretreatment structure, like specifically what I cover in DBT pretreatment. And then we're going to dive into uh, the motivational enhancement interpersonal strategies that really um, are kind of the in between the lines things uh, in DBT pretreatment. Uh, so in session one, this is an orientation, uh, really orientation and goals assessment. You should be doing uh, very little talking, but a lot more guiding, validation, open-ended questions here. Um, you're going to ask things like, what hasn't worked before? Why is, uh, why is it important to do X now? Uh, why is it important to address depression, loneliness, uh, self-harm now? Um, you're trying to uh, determine, you know, indirectly, what are the most important elements of life to you right now? Um, what about your life feels worth living? Um, and oftentimes you might get the answer that nothing feels worth living. So you may, uh, nothing, nothing in my life feels worth living. So you try to assess like, hey, what are the, the small things in life that if they, you know, that bring you, uh, you know, even just like a, a, the, that bring you like a small smile daily. Um, you're gonna to try to ask what seems to get in the way, which is usually a pretty loaded question. That, that's usually a response that gets about 10 to 15 minutes of talking. Um, so you're gonna really try to pay attention to the things that they see as being barriers to their own happiness. Um, I try to use a lot of irreverence in this, in this final question um, where, you know, how are we going to know when we reach your goals? I'll say something like, um, at what point can you fire me? Um, how how will you know that you no longer need therapy, that you don't have to come into my office every day and say, hi, Jordan, yep, I got my diary card. Um, so we want to know at what point therapy is no longer going to be needed. Visualize that day. Um, so this is, if you're familiar with, um, uh, I'm not going to be able to bring it up off the top of my head. This is the magic, it's like the, the, the magic wand question uh, from, it's a, that's going to drive me crazy. Anyway, uh, different kind of therapy. I think it's a family systems therapy. Um, and then in session one, I usually cover the stages or this first session of DBT pretreatment. I also usually cover the treatment stages and kind of this is the, the boring Jordan part where I'm giving information about DBT, um, but I'm trying to orient them to the phases of DBT and try to connect this to their goals. Um, you know, hey, if you are struggling in relationships, here's a skill in stage one that we're going to really focus on. Um, and then uh, you can kind of connect this, um, can connect those stages of treatment to their overarching goals. In session two, we are, um, <laughs> thank you, Stephanie, for the solution focused therapy in the <laughs> chat. I appreciate that. That <laughs> was like in my mind. I couldn't figure it out. Um, so uh, in session two, uh, this is where you really, uh, there's going to be kind of a balance between um, understanding you, uh, or between giving and take, or giving and receiving information. So almost like a 50 50 balance of listening versus talking and giving information. So here, I, I usually open up with, um, again, like, I want to hear how you expressed emotion uh, growing up, and how was that met? Um, what did your parents do when you threw a tantrum? Um, what did your friends do when you, uh, when you kind of, like, felt like you lost control of your emotions? So you're trying to get a sense for, number one, how long have you struggled with emotion regulation? What does it look like? And then what was the typical response um, once that happened? Um, you're trying to learn like, hey, did anyone ever talk to you about how to regulate your emotions or did they just tell you you were being dramatic? Um, so if you're familiar with, uh, you know, some of the theory behind DBT, you can probably see that we're building towards um, talking about the biosocial model for borderline personality. So um, if you're not familiar, um, I'll just give you a brief overview. It's actually a pretty great read and I think it's helped me understand a lot about my own emotions in life and um, and really, uh, you know, this kind of impact between 
um, you know, the nature side of like biologically what you're predisposed for versus what you're the impact of your environment. So the bio, during the second half of this session, I'll talk about, um, uh, you know, hey, there's this really well-researched theory about uh, how emotions develop and how skills deficits and emotions develop. Um, and it has to do with you being born uh, by through no fault of your own, just experiencing more intense emotions than most of the people in your life. Uh, and then we'll talk about, uh, you know, kind of the different forms of a chronically invalidating environment, whether that's just people who are kind of constantly looking at you saying, you know, hey, just figure it out, calm down versus, um, you know, more traumatic uh, invalidating environments, uh, child sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse, things like that. So that's what session two looks like. Um, in session three and four, we're starting to trend towards, um, again, like kind of keeping this 50-50 split where you are um, brainstorming indicators of treatment pro progress. Hey, what are the specific behaviors that you want to do more of? Um, I want to be more regulated, uh, you know, have more joy, be more present. Um, and then what are the things that you want to do less of? I want to self-harm less. I want to have um, uh, less, you know, blow up arguments with my spouse. Um, and trying to kind of get a sense for like, all right, behaviorally on a day-to-day -day basis, what does this look like and how can we track this? Then you'll move to, you know, introducing the diary card, which is DBT's way of tracking behavior daily. It's like, a, if you're not familiar with DBT, this is um, kind of a more in-depth mood tracker, um, but for specific behaviors, um, kind of a daily diary. Um, and then you'll link that to the treatment hierarchy, which has to do with um, what you prioritize in sessions, uh, in, in sessions as far as what you talk about, um, what you talk about first. So that's kind of the information giving side of things. Um, and then you're gonna have a really open discussion about therapy interfering behaviors. So session three, I try to be really flexibly. If you get through, um, if you get through half of this, that's completely acceptable. Um, but really you wanna spend time thinking about therapy interfering behaviors. Um, and that's gonna be therapy interfering behavior on the side of yourself, on the side of the client, um, on the side of technology. That's one I've like added a new category of uh, tech interfering behaviors, which usually has to do with my internet webcam or the computer that I've kept on life support all through graduate school, uh, just crapping out in the middle of sessions and therefore like us having to reschedule. So you're gonna talk about those uh, therapy interfering behaviors and that can be uh, a really short discussion or something that ends up um, occurring throughout uh, uh, over the course of a couple of sessions. Then finally, um, in session four, you're really trying to press buttons, uh, elicit emotional reactions and build commitment. So you're probing for any areas of hesitation, things that you don't like about DBT, hesitations that you have about working with me specifically, um, and really trying to kind of highlight the consequences of that. And we're gonna get into the how you do that here next. Um, and then the final element, you would you would show the treatment contract and uh, see if there's any hesitation towards like, yeah, I'm going to sign my name to commit to coming to skills group and participating in DBT for six full months. Um, that usually gets a, a pretty, uh, at least some hesitation out of folks when you present it like that. Um, all right. So in DBT, there's... Um, a lot of interpersonal strategies that we use to enhance commitment. And this comes from uh, a really cool body of literature uh, in the motivational interviewing world um, across other evidence-based treatments. And, um, and it, you know, Marsha and the other folks uh, who, who, you know, have participated in developing this treatment really boiled these down into, I, I think, just like six beautiful strategies that are really easily understood. Um, so this is, again, kind of like the how you are presenting information, the types of questions that you're asking as a therapist to, with the goal of trying to build commitment uh, in your clients. Uh, so the first one's door in the face. This is, um, this is a strategy that's kind of blunt. Uh, you're asking for a big commitment right up front without, uh, with, really without softening the, the difficulty of doing that. Um, and you're almost trying to magnify it and say like, hey, can you really do this? Can you commit to a full year um, of treatment? So um, in, in practice, this looks like, hey, these goals are really, uh, these goals are really important. Um, and you, you have to recognize that um, if you wanna solve depression and, and have more meaningful relations in your life, that's not gonna get accomplished in like two weeks. Uh, we've, got a lot of, we've got a lot of stuff to cover that's going to, uh, that's going to um, enhance your ability to do that. And to, in, in order to pursue those goals and really try to do it, 
you've got to take suicide off the table for a full year. Can you commit to not, uh, to not attempting for a full year and at least uh, trying to work on these things? Um, as you can see, that's like a pretty, you know, right, at, right in your face kind of commitment that usually makes people say, huh, I don't know. Um, if they immediately disagree and say, nope, there's no way I can do that, uh, you drop it down to a slightly less, uh, a slightly less big commitment. Okay, well, maybe six months, uh, that's about as much time as it takes to get through every single skill in DBT. Could you commit to six months? Um, and so you can see we go from like an almost unattainable, uh, an almost unattainable initial commitment of like, hey, session one, can you commit to a full year of without suicide to, okay, well, what about six months? And a lot of times after hearing that initial uh, you know, kind of door in the face, big commitment that six months feels a little bit more approachment and you can kind of build a, a little bit more approachable and you can build from there. If you get immediate agreement, uh, which is relatively rare with, with door in the face, but it does happen, uh, you're going to, and you're going to, you know, lean on another interpersonal strategy, which is kind of playing devil's advocate. Uh, you're going to say, what makes you believe that? Um, have you been able to follow through with big commitments in the past? Um, is this a behavior of like over committing that tends to come back and bite you in the butt? Why do you think you can do this right now? Um, so you're trying to kind of gain some, uh, you know, gain some insight into why they feel like they can make this big commitment. Um, and if this is a potential therapy interfering behavior. Uh, the next interpersonal style here is foot in the door. Um, so this is, um, uh, you know, the dialectical opposite of door in the face where you're trying to present a really vague, favorable, kind of low level commitment, and then uh, build from that, uh, build from there to try to build up to a, a stronger level of commitment. So you might say something like, um, okay, so I can see that, you know, suicide has been your way out of a really painful world. Um, just having it on your mind makes you feel like, okay, if the world gets really overwhelming, I have an exit plan. So I know that taking it off the table for a full year is just not gonna be possible. What if we tried to do one month? Could you take suicide off the table for one month, get through pre-treatment and just hear a little bit more about DBT? Do you think that would work for you? Um, so you're just trying to, you know, you're just trying to kind of, you know, uh, really emphasize like, hey, what's this really small thing that we can do together? Um, once you would, once you get this, uh, you know, once you get this minimum level of uh, of commitment, then you can try to build on it from there. Um, wow, I'm so impressed by your willingness to work on these problems. If someone immediately is like, oh yeah, I can take, I can take suicide off the table for a month. Uh, you're going to say something like, okay, what about three months? That would be like one full module. Um, I know that distress tolerance seems like that's a really big area for you. What if we just tried to take suicide off the table while we build up those skills and see what happens? Um, so you can see how you can kind of take that small initial commitment of a month and try to build on top of that to, all right, how about three months? That's a full module. What did you like about, um, about that commitment that made you think you could do that? Um, and then you're, yes, yeah, so that's scaling up. Um, if you get disagreement, if you get initial pushback from foot in the door, um, you might think about like elevating care. So this is almost gonna feel like kind of switching back to door in the face, but you're gonna try to really gently in a validating way do this. So if someone says, I, don't think I can take suicide off the table for 30 days. Um, your, your strategy or your response is going to be to say, hey, this pain seems so intense right now. Uh, it just seems like if suicide can't wait for 30 days, maybe we should uh, uh, talk together about getting you into residential just to get you through this period so that we can find a, a time when you can engage with DBT. Um, usually that strategy helps folks kind of loosen up and say like, okay, I don't know if I'm actually in... Um, uh, if I'm actually in this amount of distress uh, at the moment, um, I'm just scared. Uh, the, the next interpersonal style here is, is devil's advocate, where you're really trying to present arguments against making a commitment that are kind of weak um, and getting the client to argue for, uh, for their own treatment. Um, you want to magnify the, the, the patient's ability to choose whether or not to participate and to recognize the consequences. Um, so usually uh, my, my style of, of, of devil's advocate is kind of arguing for the status quo. So I'll say something like, you know what, you've been on the wait list for two months. Um, seems like you've been getting by. I mean, you got, you got yourself to therapy here. Maybe you don't need this at all. Um, 
maybe you should just like, you know, keep doing this, like have your, you know, bar stool therapy with your friends and just uh, keep doing what you're doing. Um, usually that gets folks to say, no, I do want this. I need help with X, Y, Z. Um, and so that can be a strategy to kind of break up like general and ambivalence towards therapy. Um, or if they're saying things like, eh, I don't know, DBT is really expensive. This is a big time commitment. I don't know if I want to do this. You could just, you, you kind of lean in with a weak counter argument of like, yeah, you know what? You seem like you're doing great. Um, I have a lot of uh, other people on the wait list. Like maybe we should just, you know, send you out of here and, and you go for it. Um, usually that, that brings out enough of a reaction that, <laughs> that they'll start to argue for what they, for what they want. Um, once you get them to back off, you'll kind of return to a previous commitment or you'll start to, uh, start to build towards another goal. Um, final strategy or like the second to last strategy that we use a lot is just, uh, a DVT pros and cons, which is, which is, uh, looking at the advantages and disadvantages of both doing treatment or not doing treatment. Um, this is a really, uh, I, I really lean on this one pretty, pretty heavily because it's a way to anticipate, hey, what's your mind going to say when it starts to get hard? Um, what are the disadvantages that are going to come to mind like two months in when you feel like you have another depressive episode and you're like, gosh, I'm paying all this money to go to DVT um, and I still have this depressive episode. Um, this is a way for us to kind of anticipate and start talking about like, hey, it's, you know, this is why I'm doing it. This is the, this is the advantage. I know it won't take a long time, um, but it's a, a really nice way for both of you to align and to build a sense of, um, you know, validation that like, hey, this person recognizes that this isn't just the perfect thing that I have to do. Um, and, and you can really align yourself with the client of saying, hey, this, maybe this isn't the perfect fit for you. Do you want to do something else? Um, what are the advantages of having no treatment or of um, having a different kind of treatment? Um, so you're really trying to spend a lot of time to uh, a lot of time validating and relating, you know, the potential gains or disadvantages to the client's goals. Okay. Um, in a similar way, you, you we also use freedom to choose and absence of alternatives. Um, I'm realizing that I, that time is uh, of the essence here, but. Um, so freedom to choose an absence of alternatives, DBT, one of the core DBT assumptions is that everyone has, uh, the freedom to choose, or we don't, you know, I guess maybe said another way, um, DBT doesn't assume that this is exactly what the client needs. Um, and you really want to bring that up early on in, in pre-treatment so that you, you know, you don't kind of create this like pedestal effect. Um, you want to say like, look, yeah, you don't have to do DBT. And you may not have uh, great alternatives to that. Um, you know, if you, you know, for example, like I'm from Nebraska, there's very few DBT programs there. And so um, for people in Nebraska who have reached out to me, I might say something like, you know, like there's, um, there's not a lot of DBT uh, practices there. Like you may have to try to get treatment out of state, um, either through Zoom or things like that. Um, so you're trying to magnify the tension of having very few viable alternatives um, and, and recognizing that you still have the ability to choose those ineffective or non-viable alternatives if you want. Um, you're trying to bring up realistic consequences and alternatives to therapy or to behavior change in general. So this is a big one that like sometimes come up, comes up in pre-treatment, but really um, this is something that tends to come up when people get stuck in treatment and they're like, you know what, I think I just want to drop out of treatment. It's like, all right, well, what else, what's going to happen if you do that? Uh, we've got a lot of data that of you without therapy. Uh, what do we think is most likely going to happen if you drop out of treatment? So you'll kind of talk about and embrace what the freedom to choose is. So um, I, uh, I included this in here. I think I said this like two weeks ago, actually, which was um, I had a client who was uh, just saying like, man, with all this money that I'm going to spend on treatment, I could just like take a two week vacation in Mexico. Uh, and I said, yeah, like you could, um, you could get in your car right now, go to the beach with this money. You might even be able to stay there for more like two months uh, rather than that. Um, but how long is it going to take depression to come back without any therapy, without any skills? Uh, do you think the sun, uh, the warm sand and, you know, the island or beach life is really going to uh, get you to these goals that we just talked about? Um, another strategy that we deploy pretty frequently is irreverence. This is, uh, I think, the defining characteristic of a lot of DBT therapists, um, which is being unexpected, um, uh, really uh, being unexpected, sometimes humorous, but the, but the goal is to break up 
rumination or a particular relationship dynamic um, in such a way that it kind of surprises the client and forces them to you know, step back and observe what's happening. Um, this, is, it, this is really important because humor is great in therapy. I try to bring this in as much as I can, um, but sarcasm is really invalidating and clients are really, really good about picking up on sarcasm. So be careful with how you de deploy humor or how you deploy irreverence here as a way of, um, you know, break enhancing commitment or, or trying to break up rumination because it can definitely, um, it, it can definitely backfire. Um, and again, the, the ultimate goal here is to kind of reroute, you know, once you get into uh, something that's just not effective, you're using irreverence to reroute to something that you can reinforce or something that you want to move towards. Um, so for example, uh, it, that might look something like this, where a client is kind of you know, gets into this like ruminative, hopeless pattern in session where it's like, you know what, these skills just don't work for me. My emotions never get better. I suck. I'm never going to get this. It's too hard. I don't have time. I can't do it. Um, and I might, uh, I've said this in the middle of sessions where I'll say something like, holy shit, we are just live from radio hopelessness today. Um, we're playing all the familiar tracks. Um, it's super loud. I can see that like you're singing along in the car to, to, to radio hopelessness. What has helped to turn to to bring those or to to turn that down before? What's helped you break out of this before? So you're kind of helping the client recognize, like, hey, here's rumination right here. They might smile a little bit, um, and then you're working towards a skill that you can uh, that you can kind of work on together to solve a problem in the moment. I hope I hope that makes sense. Um, it's kind of a, a difficult one to grasp early on. Um, so as we think about, uh, that, was, that was kind of the overview of, you know, all the, the different functions and, um, you know, what skills in pretreatment that we use in DBT. Um, in trauma-focused interventions, it's a little bit different. Um, I want to highlight a couple of things, um, uh, adaptations that I've used as we've worked through uh, evidence-based treatments and, and also note some, some differences uh, from the DBT style of pretreatment. Um, so we know uh, that the key ingredient in uh, trauma or in post-trauma reactions is avoidance. Um, avoidance of thoughts, avoidance of external experiences is the thing that maintains those PTSD symptoms, keeps that sense of threat high. Um, and so uh, we've got to be mindful of how we are uh, potentially aligning or contributing to avoidance in therapy. Um, that's a goal regardless of stage of therapy, but in particular, it's really important in pretreatment uh, because, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a necessary function of pretreatment, you're not engaging in the protocol yet. Um, so you, as a clinician, you've really got to balance um, kind of, be, you know, this, this urge to build commitment to understand problems uh, with avoidance of beginning the trauma-focused pro protocol. I've, I've gotten into a habit before of overdoing pretreatment and realizing like, oh, we actually just spent six weeks um, kind of talking about problems because the client uh, and myself, like we're a little nervous to get into uh, prolonged exposure type protocol. Um, so you wanna be aware of that um, and have the goal of being as concise as possible in pretreatment, but still building commitment and accomplishing a couple of goals. Um, I also wanna emphasize that uh, not everyone is going to require extensive pretreatment. Um, I know the, the cognitive processing therapy folks are particularly passionate about this, where uh, they discourage pretreatment um, for as like, it, you know, they discouraged it in their randomized control trials. And just in general, they, they, they were more concerned with avoidance, um, kind of contributing to pretreatment and keeping people in purgatory, so to speak. Um, so I want to kind of highlight, spend a little bit of time too talking about who might benefit from this and then at what point you can say, all right, like, let's do this thing and, and get rolling. Um, so a couple of alterations. Um, we are, are going to spend more, you want to have more of an emphasis on obtaining commitment quickly um, and beginning exposures. So if you are starting to worry, hey, have we been here in pretreatment too long? Um, I would... It, it, in the context of a trauma treatment, then I would uh, urge you to kind of push towards like, hey, let's begin this exposure. So you're going to kind of use that like door in the face. Hey, why don't you think we are ready for this? Why don't you think you're ready? I think we should just try it out and go for it. Um, so you're going to try to, you know, uh, emphasize that like kind of whisper of commitment as being enough to start and get going. Um, Rather than DBT, which has like a huge uh, information exchange of talking about all the different 
theories that underlie it, giving information about the modality of treatment. Um, I don't think it's as necessary in trauma-focused interventions to understand the engine uh, in order to drive the car. Um, so you're just going to try to cover the basics of the intervention then with them. So in you know prolonged expo exposure, I try to hit on uh, habituation, um, the the function of an imaginal exposure, the function of an of a in, of an in vivo exposure, and then uh, we're moving on to something else. Um, similarly, in cognitive processing therapy, um, I probably spend 15 minutes talking about the cognitive mode model at most, um, and then we are moving on to how to challenge and effectively. Um, you know, effectively develop new uh, new alternative beliefs. Um, the the key here, rather than uh, the key with this point um, on emphasizing the need to experience unpleasant emotions, um, the reason why I think this is different than DBT pretreatment is so often in stage one of DBT treatment, our clients are having these really really intense and problematic emotions with very little skill to regulate. So we have a lot of emphasis on changing emotions, trying to do things to feel different in DBT. And in trauma therapy, you want the opposite. You want people to have, uh, to experience the avoided emotions that they've been suppressing or pushing down or trying to get away from. You want people to have a strong emotional reaction when they're talking through uh, trauma, because that is the key ingredient, the exposure ingredient that's going to allow for effective processing and eventually uh, habituation. So um, in pretreatment, I try to emphasize like, hey, this isn't going to be comfortable. Uh, don't do trauma therapy on your lunch hour at work. Uh, make sure it's at the end of the day so you can go for a walk afterwards. Um, so you're going to have a, a pretty thorough assessment of distress tolerance and your mindfulness skills. Um, so usually uh, you're trying to create some uh, create some kind of exposure early on so you can get a sense for how how well uh, people are able to tolerate distress and um, if there's any skills deficits or, or mindful awareness deficits that are present. Um, the interpersonal styles should be ongoing um, and they're ongoing in DBT but I would really say like rather than um, rather than uh, really specifically working towards devil's advocate and pretreatment, uh, you might not deploy that until you've already uh, kind of gotten going with the trauma-focused protocol. So like, don't feel like they can only be used in pretreatment here. These should, really should be ongoing because again, you want to move towards getting, uh, getting going with the protocol as quickly as possible once they're, once they're in treatment. Um, and I, again, I think a, a slightly different emphasis here. I mean, the, the the relationship is always important in treatment. Um, it's, it's important in trauma, trauma-focused work as well, but there's less of, a, of an emphasis on knowing, knowing the client and the client knowing you um, as it is relative to DBT, because the focus is not necessarily about your relationship. It's about the client's ability to sit with and process emotion. And so um, you kind of trust that over the course of the protocol, the trauma-focused protocol, that relationship is going to build um, kind of regardless. Um, and so you may not need to do as much upfront work with it um, relative to DBT. Um, so again, their goal should probably be three sessions or less based on a few key factors. So um, if they've had repeated treatment failures, that might be something that said, that indicates to you that you need to spend more time in pretreatment because you you as a therapist need to understand what has gotten in the way before, what's the what are the patient's red flags that they're about to drop out or that things aren't going well. Um, and more importantly, they need to understand that too so that this therapy experience can be different. Um, the level of disorder, this one is always kind of one of those like, oh yeah, duh, but it is uh, something that we should think about. Um, how severe are the symptoms? Um, how, in, how, how severe are their avoidance strategies? Are they um, you know, using substances in conjunction with avoidance to numb emotions? Is there, has it gotten to the point of substance dependence or sub substance addiction? Um, you want to you want to understand like what the relative level of disorder is, um, and then you may expand on your pretreatment um, or say like, okay, the, these are, this is a clear cut trauma reaction. Their PCL scores are like 42, uh, but they're relatively strong in distress tolerance, so we can just move on. Um, another one that again feels kind of like, oh yeah, um, but where are they in their stage of change? Uh, did their spouse drag them to treatment and say, you have to figure this out and they don't think that there's a problem. 
Um, are they aware that there's a problem, but unsure if they really want to do the work that's necessary? Um, so that stage of change is another one that can really either lengthen the pretreatment phase or shorten it, kind of depending on where they're at. Um, and that's just a little bit different than, than DBT. Um, also their awareness of self. So um, are they aware of their values? This is uh, you know, a thing that can lengthen that pretreatment session or, or just make it more, um, more useful. Um, do they know what they want? Do they know why they're, they're participating in, uh, in trauma-focused treatment? Are they doing it just to get away from pain or are they doing it so that they can spend more time with their kids and go out uh, to dinner with their family without um, you know, having to face the door at all times? Um, do they know and understand their dysfunctional behavior um, or the, you know, the impact on relationships uh, that their uh, behaviors are having? Um, so this is this final kind of piece of this presentation. I know, I know I'm talking fast and going fast here, um, so feel free to ask questions, but I just kind of wanted to give an overview of what pretreatment might look like for trauma based on some of the principles that we've covered. Um, so session one is going to look very similar to the DBT pretreatment uh, pre-treatment session one. Um, it's a lot of listening, a lot of asking open-ended questions and a willingness to validate um, and ask follow-up questions. So you're trying to ultimately understand what, what is it that made you get online and, and search for a trauma-focused therapist right now? Um, what part of life do you feel like you're missing out on because of these symptoms? Um, how do you get through the daily pain of trauma, trauma treatments? Essentially, like how long have you been struggling with this and what are you doing to uh, to cope with it. Um, you're trying to see, uh, you know, assess for willingness um, to see if they are likely to drop out early, if they're hesitant about this, or if they have, you know, kind of that uh, inner resolve that like, hey, it's rock bottom, it's time to do this, I'm willing to do whatever's necessary to participate in treatment. Some of the key interpersonal strategies that you'll probably use in session one will be foot in the door. So you're going to look for small commitments, try to build on that, do a lot of validation. Um, and then try to connect values uh, to treatment mechanisms. So, um, you know, if you have a, you know, yeah, yeah, so you're trying to connect their values and goals to specific treatment mechanisms or things that will, um, uh, things that will kind of, they can be expecting here coming up. Uh, okay. uh, so session two is really all about avoidance. Uh, I try to spend as much time understanding what, what specifically avoidance looks like for this person sitting across from me. Um, I try to mag really under really emphasize that um, you know trauma treatments really need to be um, taken kind of like an antibiotic. Uh, you've got to see it all the way through. If you take uh, if you come to three sessions and we you know start talking about the trauma and then you're like you know what this is too much for me I'm out. Um, it's going to make things worse. So I try to magnify the consequences of like, hey, once we really get going with this, it is really important to try to get all the way through this. Um, we try to anticipate like, hey, what's it going to feel like when you get this urge to drop out? What can I do as a therapist to help get you here? Um, so you're really trying to behaviorally define what avoidance is going to look like and then, um, uh, and then you know, um, kind of build from there. Um, uh, you're going to utilize, uh, you know, those interpersonal strategies to try to magnify the commitment to avoid avoiding. So think about door in the face, devil's advocate. Um, hey, you've been avoiding for this long. It seems like it hasn't killed you. Maybe you should just keep, uh, maybe we should just keep avoiding. Is it really worth it to bring up, uh, bring up all this stuff up again and try to process it? Uh, you'll talk about pros and cons, like, hey, if you keep doing this, what's going to happen? If you do do this, what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, and then a lot of irreverence. Uh, I try to bring in humor here and, and really be an approachable person uh, in, this, in that session. Um, in session three, uh, I like to spend a lot of time thinking about, hey, when you try to quit therapy or you don't do homework, uh, how should we handle it? Um, what are things that we can, uh, like, do you have any like big trips coming up? Um, I had a, a patient uh, a while ago who uh, halfway through therapy was, or halfway through a prolonged exposure was like, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, I'm going to be gone for three weeks. And I was like, oh, that's a problem. Uh, that's like, uh, that's something that's kind of going to get away, get in the way of our effectiveness based on where we're at. So anticipate, you know, 12 weeks of therapy. Can you do it? Anything coming up within reason? Um, 
can you do homework every night? If you've got little kids and it's really hard to uh, get time by yourself for an hour each night, maybe this isn't uh, the right time to do therapy, to do trauma-focused therapy. Um, and then I spend a lot of time in some symptom education. Um, so kind of like the boring Jordan DBT, DBT voice here, um, thinking about, uh, hey, symptoms usually get worse, um, at least early on as you approach, uh, start to approach um, avoided thoughts and memories. Um, so that's usually peak up, peak dropout phase. What are we going to do then? Um, and then we try to plan for uh, when you start getting nervous to come to therapy because you know you're going to have to talk about trauma. Uh, what can we do uh, to plan for that? Uh, what can we do if um, you come to sessions drunk or high? Um, how can we uh, you know manage that so it doesn't become like a therapy rupturing behavior there? So again, door in the face, foot in the door. Um, those are some of the key. Uh, kind of interpersonal strategies that you're going to be using. So that's all I've got. Um, I know um, we're right up against it, but if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to respond here. Or I can respond in email. Um, I really appreciate all of you listening today. Uh, I know I just talked at you really quick, but i um, really excited for uh, everyone to, to try some of this out and let me know what you think. So thank you.